we are back with perhaps the most anticipated trail shoe of the last 12 to 36 months, uh, just depending on when this shoe got on your radar. We're talking about the Nike Zoom X Ultrafly Trail, and we have put it through the miles, and we are ready to actually do a long-term review on this shoe. Finn, how are it's you doing? Fi it, it's finally here. It's finally, it's finally here. here. I've known about this shoe since 2021 because Tyler Green actually wore an early prototype of it at the 2021 Western States. And then he wore it again at 2022's Western States and everyone thought the shoe was going to come out, but all the you know production was so delayed that they pushed it another year. And then the shoe was supposed to come out in I think April or May of 2023, but then they delayed it a few more months so that way they could stick this fancy Vibram outsole on it so now we're looking at an official launch date of august 2023 i think it's the beginning of august i haven't found an actual number but august 2023 the shoe's finally going to exist and be available for consumer purchase we uh we got these pairs from nike at western states they were actually giving a whole bunch of them out at the forest hill aid station which was pretty cool a little marketing uh tactic for them um they did not give us these you know to tell us to review them they said take these shoes run in them do whatever you want they actually even explicitly told me at the award ceremony be fully honest in this shoe review they want to hear every single piece of critical feedback i thought that was really cool like i spoke to the nike Ooh, designers that's a dangerous directly, ask. and they said i want you to be super honest and honest i will be i'll so, be dishonest to balance us out Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll do like two truths and a lie. <laughs> the Nike Zoom X Ultrafly Trail. I'm just going to call it the Ultrafly for the purposes of this review to save time. 250 US dollars. So we're in the full super shoe price category. Um, I For some of our trail shoes, we've been calling them the hyper shoe category, like our Nordas and our Speedlands. Um, I think this falls into the super shoe price category more so than the uh, hyper shoe category because this isn't your small mom and pop brand that you're just like helping support. Like this is the one of the biggest the biggest athletic brand in the world making a shoe that has every single piece of tech in it from their fastest road shoes in the world trying to convert it to trail. Uh, mm. My pair came in at ten and a half ounces, and this is a men's U.S. size ten stack height. We're looking at thirty millimeters of squishy zoom x foam in the forefoot and 38.5 millimeters in the heel so we're looking at an 8.5 millimeter drop and um you know we were just talking about how you know we recently reviewed the hoka tecton x um we didn't review it but i've run in the saucony endorphin edge and those are kind of i would say it's two closest competitors you know relatively super ish foam carbon plate expensive um, this is the highest stack of the three. Um, for materials, we have Nike's, uh, it's a vapor weave upper. So it's like a very, I don't, is it mesh or is it plastic? I can't really tell. It's like either a very tight weave, super thin mesh, or it's a very, very lightweight plastic. There's additional structure built into it. Like there's like an entire, it looks like a piece of graph paper. Um, super thin, one piece. There, The tongue is very minimal and it's gusseted right into uh, an additional midfoot wrap that anchors down uh, at the midfoot. The heel and the ankle collar, the heel cup, um, reminded me a lot of the newest Kyger and Wild Horse. Like it felt pretty much yep. identical, that kind of medium amount of foam, slightly on the firmer side, you know, rigid heel cup. Anything anything I'm missing about the upper? I feel like that's pretty much it. I, I had one question for you on the weight. Did you think that given how historically light the zoom x foam is did this feel like a unusually heavy shoe to you yes i thought it would be lighter 10 and me too 10 and, and so then i i really dove deep into it of like why did this shoe weigh 10 and a half ounces and so the tecton x is an ounce lighter um the endorphin edge is an ounce lighter both of them have almost an ounce worth of foam less so i think that's really ultimately what it comes down to but I will say Zoomax foam is lighter than Hoka's foam that they put in the Tecton X. Um, I think it's even a little bit lighter than the um, super foam that Saucony put in their endorphin series. So I'm curious if like maybe they're using a denser Zoomax than 
in the vapor fly and alpha fly. I mean, it definitely feels plenty soft, but maybe it's denser. I don't know if the glue and the fabric that they put around this midsole adds weight, but, um, yeah, I agree. I thought it would be a little bit lighter. Um, it's, I guess it's light enough, but yeah, you're right. Uh, just interesting to me. Yeah. I did think that was super bad because the upper super lightweight, like this is perhaps the same material that was on the first generation of the Vaporfly next percent. Yeah. And that shoe weighed seven ounces. The midsole is as far as I know, just classic zoom X super foam. Um, you know, it's the same foam that we see in the Vaporfly and the Alpha Fly. Uh, there is Nike's carbon fiber fly plate. It is their full carbon, full stiffness, the whole shebang it's in there, which like, I mean, yeah, you, you love bending the shoes during the shoe review. Please don't do that. You'll snap I couldn't do half. this. I couldn't do it with this one. No, it's like one of the stiffest shoes I've ever felt in hand. Yeah. Like it just, it, it does not bend. It's um, like a Napoleon dynamite when he tries to like break open like the fish tank thing and he can't do it. <laughs> Like I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. Wait, well, what is it that he's trying to do? Oh, he's trying to. Oh, he's trying to break the Tupperware container. <laughs> trying to break. That's the what Tupperware. it is. He's selling Tupperware and he's trying to snap. He's like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> That's how this is. This is the 1980s Tupperware equivalent of a stiff shoe. <laughs> um. So the other the other element of this midsole is it is wrapped in a fabric. It's there for two reasons. One, to keep the foam from squishing too much outward. They want that energy return to go up and down and not out. The other big reason is to protect it. So I actually got to do two wear tests with Nike in the last year for this shoe. And I can't speak too much onto the actual wear test, but I did get to test a pair that didn't have this fabric. And within the first 50 miles of the shoe, I had poked multiple holes in the sidewalls of the Zoom X. I've never had an issue with the fabric wrapped Ultrafly. So I think that's the correct call for them. Like that was there for the right reasons. Yep. The outsole is perhaps the piece of the shoe that has been most talked about or, you know, most, um, I don't know, it's had the most stoke. Um, and that is because Nike has finally inked a contract with Vibram and this Ultrafly gets the Vibram mega grip outsole on its light base and we'll i don't know we'll dive more into that later but it's a full it's one piece it's full length um as with you know the zoom x foam being very fragile um that's why you're not seeing any exposed foam underfoot um unlike the kyger where there is a, a, an exposed section um you're just not going to see that with zoom x foam it's too fragile so perhaps that's also playing a little bit into the weight of the shoe is the fact that they had to use a full piece of rubber, whereas the Hoka Tecton X, they were able to use two smaller, more minimal pieces of rubber. So maybe maybe in a future shoe, there's some potential weight savings there. Finn, how many miles did you get out of this one? 98 miles, 75% on what arguably this shoe is designed for, which is like flowy single track Jeep road type trails, 20% on steep and technical grade, because I did see out on the interwebs that it would be interesting to challenge this shoe on that type of terrain. We can talk about that later. And then I actually did do a little bit of road mileage, about 5% of those miles were on roads near my house. How about you? You've got like 600, right? Well, so this pair I have 88 miles on. So great, Scott. Back to the future, 88 miles, not in one hour, but 88 miles on this shoe. I had the fortune of actually wearing an early Ultrafly at Western States last year in 2022. I wore the Ultrafly from Robinson Flat to the finish. So that was 70 miles. How much changed between last year and what we're looking at right now? Just, um, just the outsole. Uh, my pair just had Nike, Nike rubber on it. The lugs were actually a little bit different. Uh, the pattern was in my opinion, better, but much less durable. So I understand why they changed it. Um, that's it though. The, the midsole and the upper were all exactly the same. So I wore it for 70 miles. I did a bunch of training runs in it before. So I have like 120 miles on that pair and then two, 200 mile wear tests with other tester pairs, which were just about the same as this one. So I've run a cumulative total of like almost 600 miles in Alistair Fly. So I'm like super familiar with the way that this shoe feels, which I think is good because it's long enough where like any of the like 
magic unicorn dust over how cool the shoe is has definitely settled now so i can see it for what it is um but yeah 88 miles on this pair ton of vert i did some really steep climbing and descending um kind of like you had mentioned like i really set out to challenge the shoe and see see where the what the pocket was for the shoe like where is this shoe excel where does it suck if anywhere and uh yeah we'll we'll move on to that and 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 just a and just a tick what did you think of the fit so this shoe is astonishingly wide across the forefoot like this is the closest yes. thing that i have worn to the ultra mount blanc that we reviewed the topo pursuit that we reviewed i could not believe that nike went to this length to make such an accommodating fit up front yes so that it, was amazing it is full it is like full topo width in the front full topo width in the front this is not an issue that I had with the Kyger or the Wild Horse or the Zagama that when we reviewed it, because I know that we've you talked about how this has like a similar heel cup fit. I did find that I didn't have great lockdown in the heel cup. I do think I attribute that to the times where I was on more technical trail and just there was that incompatibility with like the carbon plate and being responsive mm -hmm. in those scenarios. But overall, great. Um I was going to talk later about comparing this to the Tectonics to the Hokus we reviewed. And I think I like the Matrix upper in terms of fit a lot more than I like this Vapor Weave, mm, but mm -hmm. not by much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Agreed. You know, having worn this shoe for a while now, it's the reason I say it's more topo fit than ultra fit is because you get that extreme width and roundness in the toe box, but it's very much medium width under the, in the midfoot. And the heel like some of the ultras like the ultra lone peak is pretty wide from heel to toe or toe to heel uh this is like wide in the forefoot and then pretty normal in the midfoot and the heel so like if you have a very high volume foot um and you need a wide everywhere you might be okay in the forefoot but then it might still be snug in the back half for this shoe so that's just something to to remember but yeah definitely um and and for not having a very wide foot I actually like I was able to get the like lockdown fine. I did notice heel slippage as well, but I am attributing that to the stiffness of the shoe and not so much the actual fit of the heel cup. Um, because like when I run flat things, my heel didn't move at all. But I think it's when we go up really steep things because the shoe doesn't bend, you know, it creates like a counter lever and it, you know, your heel just it the shoe just does not want to stay with your heel. And it was never a problem. But it was just annoying. Yep. Um, yeah. There was a couple more things that I wanted to bring up with you, mostly questions. Like you meant you were talking about the the new Viber mount sole on the shoe, different from the prototype you're using at States in 21 or 22. Um, it's interesting to me that they went with this Vibram outsole. And I'm bringing this up also because I never thought I'd see the day where I would have a chance to try a shoe that you haven't tried yet, which is just amazing to me, given your, your pedigree in the trail community. But I have worn Nike's Pegasus Trail GTX shoe before. That has the mitten rubber on it. And if you go back and look at those reviews, that shoe sort of cracked the code that Nike was having issues with about like a durable, stable outsole in wet, snowy, muddy type conditions. And Nike rarely does co-branding. So I'm very, it's just interesting to see them do this collab with, with Vibram when they have in-house outsole material that I think could do close to as good of a job, if not the same. Okay. So I wrote down, I put in bold letters, hot take. I'm not sure if it needed to be Vibram, but I'll tell you, here's my theory on why I think it does need to be Vibram. So, okay. Actually backing up, this is why I don't think it needs to be Vibram. One, I do think Nike has an in-house outsole rubber. That's good enough for where this shoe should be run. If you're running on technical terrain with like slick rock, you know, uneven, mossy roots, et cetera, et cetera, where you need that Vibram outsole, you shouldn't be wearing this shoe. Like I think, yes. I think this isn't the shoe for that. Um, on all the places where I think this shoe excels, I don't think you need so much Vibram outsole rubber you don't need you, you don't need the grip from the rubber material it'll come from the shape of the lugs actually digging into the ground so I, I totally i think that like the rubber that was used on the kyger 
would totally work for for this Ultrafly. The reason why I think that they went with Vibram is because for a shoe this expensive, there needs to be a price quality relationship for every single element of the shoe. Like we both know if it has a Vibram outsole on it, it's going to be very grippy and it's going to work. Yep. Even though we both think that another outsole would have been just fine. The fact that this says Vibram is going to get people to try it out because they're like, Oh, finally Nike's given up on their outsole rubber. So I think it's purely for that price quality relationship. That's a great point. One of my questions, you know, we normally save this for the end, but we'll add one in the middle question for the audience. If this didn't have Vibram outsole and had their own in-house rubber, but cost $200 instead of 250, are you more or less likely to buy the shoe or the same? Which one? Which great, one? Great question. Which one? It's like that <laughs> scene from Silicon Valley. It's like, are you more or less or the same likely to purchase this app? Which one? Which one? Which one? <laughs> yes. I would buy it. I would buy it. I, I totally would be up for saving a few dollars to not have the Vibram outsole. And that's my hot take, I guess. And then one thing I also... I actually don't particularly love the lug pattern on this shoe. No, and they're um, not very aggressive either. They're not very aggressive, and they I don't think they need to be. Like, they're the same height as the Tecton X outsole lugs. For some reason, I felt better grip in the Tecton X, and I think it's because the lugs are smaller and there's more of them. I'm getting a little bit too much surface area from each lug, and they don't really get to bite into the ground that well. Um also, I'll try my best to, to to show this, but right under the midfoot, there's a section of like little, it's like a waffle design. There's all these little squares right under like the midfoot teetering into the front half of the shoe. But the problem with that is because those are also a millimeter deep, the first set of lugs like right at the base of the forefoot are now also one millimeter less tall. So I had some times where I was hiking up some looser single track and my foot would slip out just because the lugs were a little bit too flat and there wasn't enough bite into the ground. So I would love to see, like maybe take some design cues from the Hoka Zanal. Let's, let's it's see a few one more the... lugs and a little bit shorter. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say one more thing about the Vibram thing. And this is probably just me being a weird, like marketing nerd, but I, I had always appreciated Nike being so big that they could operate in this like post partnership slash collaboration reality. And I feel like them, like, you know, biting the bullet and working with Vibram kind of undermines my brand affinity. So I don't know. I kind of like their power move of being like, we're above collaborations, we're above partnerships and here they go. Well, I'm all for that if you can do it all good, but like, you know, up until this year, Nike's outsole rubber had been relatively mediocre. Um, unfortunately, the one year that they happened to figure out their outsole rubber is also the year where they decide to ink a contract with Vibram. Um, I know. I know. It's interesting. Can we talk about the midsole a bit? Yeah, what did yeah, what did you think of the Zoom X midsole and the carbon fly plate? Oh, gosh. Well, and again, I don't know near I I I shouldn't even say nearly. I don't know anything about road shoes, barely anything. And but I have heard that like there is this Zoom X magical sensation that you feel in the Alpha Flies and the Vapor Flies and the well, the, the thesis um, or the the Hoka Rocket X2 is very close. Very close. Yeah. But so like, like, I would, I, I would gauge that as, as kind of the bar. Um, but yeah, they, they basically tried to transfer that feeling in alpha flies and in vapor flies over to a trail shoe. And, um, yeah, I would say regarding like the carbon fiber plate, I, I get the experiment. I get the push for like extra stability and energy return on trails. I think my only thing here, and it was, we were talking about it earlier, like trying to like move move this shoe um why not use like a more flexible nylon plate um especially in a trail community where you're going to be running at a lot slower paces on a lot steeper climbs a lot more uneven terrain it's impossible to move this shoe in hand it's a very stiff plate so that was like my first reaction to that um one thing i will say about the foam before i give it back to you is um first step into the shoe two weeks ago when i got it like you definitely feel that incredibly soft feeling underfoot and, but you don't feel the carbon plate. Like I did not feel the carbon plate. Mm -hmm. Um, like you do notice the forward levering action as soon as you start running, 
Um, but the foam is so soft that I felt insulated from the carbon plate, which was very interesting. I, now yeah. the other question is like, is it too soft as a result? Is it too soft? Um, but those were like my first initial reactions about the carbon plate in the foam. Yeah. You feel zero harshness or firmness from the carbon plate being in the shoe. Whereas like you can kind of feel the foam almost bottoming out in like the Tecton X when you like hit the carbon, um, which like, I don't know yeah. if I'd say it's a bad thing. It, it didn't seem to ever give me any foot fatigue, but like the zoom X foam is definitely like fully bottomless cushioning. Um, yeah. The question is like, because it is like, like, I never felt like, did you ever, I never felt like I was bottoming out the cushioning of this shoe. Never. And but then I, the question I was not like, say the same about other super shoes, quote unquote, super shoes that we've, we've used. Yeah. So then it's like, but does a, tra does a trail shoe need that much cushion? And I say yes and no, it depends on where you take the shoe. So that was kind of like going but to that's like, like a road shoe thesis right i know like, so it's it, like it can't what be did... too soft yeah it can't be too soft but it has to be able to return energy like usually traditionally a soft foam doesn't return energy all these super critical super foams they're soft and they return energy which on the roads is incredible because you don't get as beat up and it still stays fast do you need a trail shoe to return this much energy and i said yes and no because i think that this shoe is incredible for a very small window of terrain. So running on a flat dirt road, this feels like a 10 and a half ounce super shoe. Like it feels like a 10 and a half ounce vapor fly where it's stiff. There's a rocker. It launches me forward. It's super bouncy. It's just three ounces heavier than a vapor fly, but it feels like every element of a super shoe. You add in some slight runnable uphills and downhills. Now you get a little bit of grip still feels incredible you add in steeper climbs and descents and we're talking dirt road or single track um you add in the steeper stuff where you're either running like on your toes or you're hiking that's where i think the magic in the shoe gets completely lost on both climbing yeah. and descending so like on the climbing running on my toes if like it's so steep that my heel doesn't touch the ground, I did not enjoy it because the shoe's so stiff. It would just like yank my heel down and I would get a little bit of slippage every single step and there's nothing I could do about it. And then on the other hand, on the way down, when you're running down something that steep, you don't want the shoe to be rebounding all that energy and further pushing you forward. You want a very dead, like low rebound, uh, type foam like anyone in the mountain biking world will understand that if you're <laughs> descending something you don't want yeah. your suspension rebound to be super high you want the rebound to be low but not so low that you bottom it out all the time and it can't come back i think the rebound on this shoe is too high for steep stuff so that's why then where the shoe is incredible it's kind of a it's somewhat of a small window and as soon as you go out of it i, I it doesn't make much sense to me what do you think yeah, about the same. I I think the only other thing I would add there is uh, I just had a chance to test this shoe quite a bit on uneven surfaces, and we've now had enough of a stockpile of different shoes over the last year or so to know kind of like what works and what doesn't in those conditions. And I, I definitely didn't get any ground feel at all on any of those types of surfaces. And I think that's a problem for me. That's where like in the debate between like more cushion and more ground feel, like I, I would want a shoe like this to have even just like minimum viable ground feel. And there was none of that. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I just, I just don't think it's a shoe meant for technical running. Um, this is a shoe meant for very much like West coast cruiser trails, dirt roads. Which is, which then always leads me to like the argument of like, why would I even choose this shoe over like an alpha fly or a vapor fly on, trails that have yeah. like no rocks on them uneven surfaces like that's where like the use case for the shoe to me like totally disappears because so like if you're gonna do any trail running sorry go ahead i was just saying, like here's a course like like where i would wear this and not a vapor fly um the black canyon 100k runnable you would wear this shoe at black canyon yeah totally this could handle this could handle those kinds of rocks and it's mostly running um I wouldn't wear a vapor fly at Black Canyon. I think that's dumb. 
the other, like the bubble race is like Javelina, like the Javelina hundred mile, like an alpha fly makes me nervous because there's air units. And when you combine air units with desert cactus, oftentimes you get flat tires and getting yeah. a flat on your alpha fly would really suck. So like just the security of having just a little bit more durability would be really nice. See, I just think there's just enough technicality on the Black Canyon course and even on the Javelina course, for example, where with a shoe like this, which does not, I, at least in my experience, does not contour well very laterally, I would get very nervous to wear this shoe. And like, there wouldn't be much of a difference for me between like picking one of the road super shoes in this shoe, but that's just me. So having worn this for the last 70 miles of Western States, I thought this was going to be, this shoe was designed, so much of the design around the shoe was at Western States. I figured it would be a perfect Western States shoe. This is not a blow up friendly shoe. Like this is only meant to be run at Western States if you are running pretty fast the whole time. So I think this is, <laughs> this is not a hundred mile shoe for most people. Once I started to falter right around Green Gate at mile 80 and my feet were spending a lot of time on the ground, I was just bouncing and stumbling all over the place with sh this shoe. And I wished for something yep. a little bit more stable, a little bit more like dead feeling like a wild horse or a Zagama for staying in the Nike lineup. But for like the middle 50 miles or 40 miles, this shoe is incredible. So in terms of like, so Nike designed, this is a trail racing shoe, like that's what Nike made this for. And of course you can train in a racing shoe now because they're high cushioned and whatnot. And you would want to train in a shoe before you race in it. I think I am saving this shoe for some like runnable 50 K to maybe hundred K races. I don't, I don't think I would wear it again for Western States because I am simply not fast enough for it. <laughs> Would you race? Well, this? you are, you are fast enough, Brett. First of all, you're one of the better runners in the sport. But but um, I was I mean, not fast saw, enough. Like I'm not running sixteen on that day, hours at on Western. that day. Yeah. Like I'm not. If you're running sixteen hours at Western States, this is a fine shoe. But that pace is like you know nine minute pace. If you can run nine minute pace for like your more runnable fifty k, this would be a great shoe. Yeah. Not that many people are running nine minute pace for a hundred mile, and that's that's so, just where that's at. Correct me if I'm wrong, but. Second and third place male finishers at Western States, Tyler Green and Anthony Costales, both wore this shoe at least from Robinson Flat to the finish. I think Anthony wore the Solomon Genesis mm -hmm. in the high country. I, and Tyler, he wore might the have worn time. it start to finish, start to yep. finish. Yep. Wow. And the, yeah. Which is like, that's impressive. I mean, Tyler's been running and clearly Tyler loves this shoe. Like he's worn <laughs> this for everything. Like he did like the Tiger Claw 50 mile in it, I think. And he might I even he'll do UTMB. UTMB in it. Yeah, I yeah. bet he will. Some people are just going to like the shoe and be fine with it. Maybe Tyler has the world's strongest ankles and the stiffness of the carbon doesn't matter. But yep. for me, like, like, like I would, I would take this at Black Canyon. That's probably the most technical race. Like I would do it at, and like, that's also because it's like flatter. Um, a lot of the local races in the Rogue Valley here, I would wear this for like the Siskiyou out and back, like 50 K to hundred K. This is perfect for that. If I, if I'm looking to win Western States, yeah, sure. I'll throw this on, um, formidable, way too cool. 50 K. This could be great. Um, a bubble race that I think could actually be nice for the shoe is, um, the Leadville hundred. Yeah. You just got to survive. One. You just got to survive hope pass in the shoe, but then all <laughs> the other runnable bits of the trail, this would be nice. So I did a long run in the, um, why am I blanking the Hoka? What's, tecton? what's the, what, the no, Zanal. not the Tecton, the Zanal. I did, I did a long run in the Hoka Zanal two, and then the, which is a very responsive shoe. And then the very next day did a long run in this shoe about four hours time on feet. And without a doubt, like, you know, we, we've been talking about the cushioning underfoot. This is a, regardless of what I've said about like technicality, steep, whatever, this is a great shoe for long days. Like if you have to pick a shoe in your quiver for a long day out on trail, there's going to be a lot of comfort in this shoe. Okay. For $250, does this shoe check enough boxes for you to be worth it? Cause it's an expensive shoe. Like you're paying for that first mover. This is Nike's first like quote unquote trail super shoe. It's right at the price point of the vapor fly. You get, you get the vapor weave, you get the fly <laughs> plate, you get this, you get the canvas, you get the Vibram outsole. <laughs> it's $250. Where do, where, how does that sit with you? So for gear nerds like you and me, 
I'm buying it, of course, but I'm yeah. always on conversational pace, looking out for Joe the plumber, the average Joe out there that's just trying to find a Swiss army knife that's going to satisfy like three different types of trail running conditions. This and is not a Swiss super, army knife. This is not a Swiss army knife. This is a, this is a total specialist gear nerd. This is like a, this is a samurai that, sword. This is a samurai sword. And I am going to, whatever is just below samurai and like the karate belt category. I'm going with that. I would always point people to either go to the Speedland GS Tam or the Hoka Tecton X2 because I think that those two options in the super shoe category work in more varied terrains than this but shoe does. And that's the GS Tam is $25 more and the Tecton X is only $25 less. If you're spending 225 on a Tecton X2, why not just spend the $25 more? For the Nike Ultra Fly, because I think the Tecton X2 works in more variable terrains. Like if I compare this really quickly, okay, both are long distance ultra racing options. Both have carbon plates that are less noticeable because of the foams. Ultra Fly, yes, I would say is softer underfoot. Uh, plate impulse is uh, less noticeable. Um, maybe faster on runnable courses, but the Tecton X2 I think wins in moderate and technical terrain. And their carbon plate, I think, is better in all mountain terrain. Uh, and I also think that the Hoka Matrix, the upper, the Matrix upper is better than the Ultra Fly Vapor Weave. And the Matrix upper is, is hard secure. to beat. It's hard yeah. to beat. And so do I think the Ultra Fly is better in the category it was built for? Yes. But I think that when you extend out beyond that, which is what most trail runners do, uh, the the Tecton X2 wins. See, and if we're just going for like what checks more boxes in terms of value, Dude, give me the Mafate at 180 over the Tecton X at well, 225. Yes, 100%. So okay. then, like, game, so, game set. So match. then, yes. Now, if we're looking back, love like the Mafate. Trail Super Shoes or whatever. I don't know. I guess, damn, I can't believe I'm calling them Trail Super Shoes. It's not a super shoe. It's sometimes a super shoe. It's not a shoe that you're just like putting in your like daily rotation. It's not like a daily trainer. Yeah. Um, it's a special occasion go fast, have fun type shoe. It does bring a lot of smiles when you're, <laughs> when you hit it in the right, you know, when you're in the right lane, when you're in the right lane for the shoe, it's awesome. It is a great looking shoe, by the way. If there was one thing that I regretted doing is just wearing it in like dusty train because it is such a sexy shoe and like non shoe aficionados, just like people Here. on the street will comment Holly, on the shoe. Hollywood magic. So Are we good. ready for some Hollywood magic? <laughs> <Yeah>. Boom. <laughs> This is what it originally oh, looked like. Origi yeah, I got the dusty, you know, but um, okay, so the one other thing I want to say, one other yeah. thing I want to say is, and you mentioned it last episode, Nike has, is experiencing a trail running revolution right now. I am in absolutely in love with the vast majority of their line, the Kyger, the Wild Horse, the Zagama. I, I like the shoe a lot. My only criticism is that it's just, it's a super deep cut type shoe for an extremely niche portion of a niche sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, one one more thing I wanted to do before we wrap this up. Thank, huge, huge shout out. Thank you to anyone who's still still listening. Um, but we'll make sure to cut this episode up into lots of chapters so you can skip around. Things that I would like to see in the next version of this shoe. So we had already talked about it. It's like, I, I, we're not sure if it needs Vibram. Sure, maybe you can keep the Vibram. I would like to see a different outsole pattern to improve the dry conditions grip. You know, I think there's some smaller lugs and more of them. Like you had said, like Finn, your trail running shoe, like IQ is, is increasing so much every single episode because you, you knocked on so many things that I had written down for my notes. Um, with the main one, the best with the main one being, um, I would love to see this plate not be carbon and be like a nylon, plate nylon. with a little more flexibility. Cause yeah. I don't think we're going to lose any of the magic feel from the zoom X, but it might help with some of the steeper, ascending and descending and then here's my other hot take i want to see a four to six millimeter drop instead of eight and a half and either when you drop two to four millimeters of foam from the heel you either lose an ounce of weight or like that one spongebob episode with the alaskan bullworm why don't we just take the zoom x and push it somewhere else like what if <laughs> what if you had like 33 it's in an alaskan bull worm it's big dairy it's mean but i'd be curious to see what this feels like with a more flexible plate and a lower drop and then just push some of that foam to the forefoot and 
yeah, that, I mean, who knows? Maybe that's a completely different shoe altogether. Maybe it's ultra fly too. Hopefully Nike listens and takes some feedback. We'll see. Uh, the only ones that I would want to extend on that is either rounded laces or a boa dial system and maybe an insertable carbon plate. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> you don't like the laces? I actually, that, that is one thing I don't like. I don't like huh. these like fat, like, cause I did take this oh. in wet conditions and they start to like expand and contract and um. it, it, where like the, they like the shoe, like untie the laces, like untie themselves. No, I didn't get these shoes I was just wet. joking about the insertable carbon <laughs> yeah. plate. <laughs> um, and as always, you know, once the shoe does go live on running warehouse, we'll have a link below. Um, if you want to try the shoe out. Your purchase, your like, your subscribe it helps support the channel, allows us to keep pumping out in-depth shoe reviews like this. But yeah, let us know what you think. You know, is is this is this the um the you know the upper end, you know, your two hundred plus dollar shoe? Like if you could only buy one, is this the one you're gonna get? Or are you gonna go for that Sockney Endorphin Edge, uh Hoka Tecton X2, Speedland GS Tam, Norda 001, 002, not carbon, but expensive, you know? If if you've got if you've got a paycheck to throw down on some shoes. What are you getting?